Let's talk about the role of biologically important nutrients as a limiting factor for the growth of phytoplankton. If you remember from chapter 6, we talked about the N to P to K ratio. I even showed you a, uh, a box of miracle Grow on the front where it says N to P to K. So uh, if you go down to your local hardware store or local nursery, your Lowe's or uh, Home Depot garden center and look at a bag of fertilizer, you see N to P to K on it. And those N to P to K ratios, that nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium ratio, are ideally set for particular kinds of things that you want to grow. Roses have one N to P to K ratio. Citrus trees have a different one. Tomatoes, corn, all these different kinds of things need different concentrations or different ratios of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But all plants, including phytoplankton, need these what are called macronutrients. They need a source of nitrogen, a source of phosphorus, and a source of potassium. Some plants also need what I call micronutrients. And some uh, oceanographers would, uh, would claim that iron and silica, because they're needed in large amounts by certain species, may also be considered ma macronutrients. And I'm not going to argue with the guys that are smarter than me about this. But my point here is to illustrate that some chemicals, some compounds, some elements are needed by all organisms, N and P and K, and others are needed by some species. Not all species of phytoplankton require silica. Not all species, in particular cyanobacteria, require iron. So that's my distinction between macronutrients and micronutrients. Well, these substances have to be available or the phytoplankton won't grow. The absence of one may limit the growth of the phytoplankton. And we can look at it in terms of how we saw in figure 6.3. This is, uh, presents Liebig's law of the minimum or the concept of a limiting factor. Just like a bucket will only hold as much water as its shortest plank, the same thing is true for all the variety of elements that a particular organism needs. If these elements here, these compounds, represent the nutritional or the uh, fertilizer needs of a particular plant or phytoplankton, if nitrogen's in the least supply, if nitrogen is the shortest plank, then this is what's going to control the growth of this organism. If, on the other hand, iron is in the least supply, it wouldn't matter how much we have of all these other things, iron would then be the element that controls the growth of those species. So, the concept of a limiting factor. We also had this picture, uh, this figure, 613 in Chapter 6, so I'm encouraging to go back and take a look at these because, it, again, it gives you the idea that these nutrients, and remember, they're dissolved in seawater. They're not little sandwiches floating around that phytoplankton with teeth come along and eat. They absorb these compounds through their cell walls, just like you absorb food through your stomach and intestines. You're absorbing dissolved substances through your cell walls, just like the phytoplankton are. They're absorbing dissolved phosphorus and dissolved nitrogen source, nitrate, iron, and silica across their cell wall. And any one of these things, the micronutrients or macronutrients, may limit phytoplankton growth. If we look at it in terms of a curve, it's very similar to the one that we saw earlier for light. The concentration of nutrients on the x-axis here, going from zero to increasing, the growth rate going from zero to increasing. As you increase the concentration of nutrients, you reach some point where it saturates, no more increases in the nutrients, but you have maximal growth rate for a particular nutrient concentration. This is really where organisms want to be. They want to be able to grow maximally. They, so the rate of supply of a particular nutrient needs to be this high for that organism to grow at this maximal rate. Otherwise, if the concentration is lower, then the growth rate of the organism slows and slows and slows until it can't grow at all. So, ultimately, nutrients control how many phytoplankton we can have. Just like the amount of food for a uh, particular species, or even for us, determines how many humans there are on the planet, the amount of nutrients ultimately control 
how much phytoplankton biomass that we find at a particular location. As it turns out up in the Arctic, where the sea ice is melting, nitrate, which is the primary nitrogen nutrient for phytoplankton in the world ocean, nitrate concentrations are the, among the highest in the world. As a result, phytoplankton concentrations up in the Arctic are the highest in the world. It's an odd thing, but you normally think of tropical environments as being rich and productive. Well, in the ocean, the tropics are really the desert, other than coral reefs. Where all the action is, where we have lots of phytoplankton and lots of organisms that feed on those phytoplankton, are the polar environments. And in some ways, that should be a little bit alarming to us because with the melting of the sea ice in the Arctic and melting of ice in the Antarctic as well and shifts in currents in both those locations, the ability of those locations to produce food or the productivity of those environments um, may be threatened as well. And so entire food webs are depending on them. And again, highest phytoplankton biomass where we have the highest concentrations of nitrate and that turns out to be in Arctic waters. As I mentioned before, nutrients play a role on the kinds of species that we find so that if there is a lack of iron, we generally don't find diatoms. If there's a lack of silica, if silica runs out, diatoms won't grow anymore. So the types of nutrients, as well as their abundance, is going to determine the amount of phytoplankton as well as the species. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about this, another Klein, in this case what we call the neutrocline, and just like a thermocline is a region of rapid change in temperature, and a halocline is a region of rapid change in salinity, and a pycnocline is a region of rapid change in density, a neutrocline is a region of rapid change in the concentration of nutrients. And in this case, we're just going to take a look at something like nitrate, which is, again, the most common limiting nutrient in the world ocean, although not the only one. If we go out and measure the concentration of nitrate in the water column, at a particular time of year, we will find a curve that looks like this. I didn't put uh, an axis on here, but in the upper... 10 meters, we have no nutrients, no nitrate at all. As we go deeper, we see that the concentration of nitrate or nutrients increases very rapidly to some maximal concentration, and we find that concentration to be similar throughout the rest of the water column. The question is, what happened to the nutrients up here in the surface waters? They were absorbed by the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton use nutrients, and in doing so, they remove them from the surface waters. And if they are not resupplied, and we'll see why that might not occur in a few minutes, if they're not resupplied, then they're going to run out. And in that case, um, nitrogen concentrations are going to control the rate of carbon fixation. So where nutrients disappear, rates of growth slow or go to zero. And so in this case, the concentration of nutrients is controlling the growth rate of the phytoplankton. So we go between two different situations. One where light intensity controls the amount or the growth rate of phytoplankton and one where nutrients control the growth rate of the phytoplankton. And where this nutrients change where these nutrients increase rapidly in concentration we call that the neutrocline or in this case because we were talking about nitrate it would be called the nitrocline 